Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have you here on behalf of CH's family, particularly his sons that are here today. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this afternoon. It was only about 20 minutes ago that I knew CH was Charles Hewitt. Maybe some of you knew that. I did not. So uh, that's one known fact as a result of today. You know, when we come together for times like this, uh, I think there are multiple purposes. And one, of course, is to remember our loved ones and our friends. And later in the service this afternoon, you'll have an opportunity, if you would like, to honor CH with your memories of him. And of course, a, a second desire that we have today is to show our love and support to CH's family. And again, thank you for being here to do that. I want to tell you that I specifically wore a suit today for CH. Those of you who come to church here at New Life know that we're not much for suits, but I think I knew CH well enough to know that he was a man of some propriety, and uh, he, would, he would appreciate those of you who are here in suits today, and he would say that that was a job well done dressing yourselves. My red tie is for my friend Pete. I don't wear red ties very often. So again, thank you for being here. Let's pray, and then we'll have some music. Father God, thank you for loving us the way that you do. I believe that if you were here with us today in the form of your son, Jesus, what you would ask us to do is to love you and to trust you. And it is my prayer for all of us that are here today, particularly for CH's family, that we would have an opportunity today to express that we love you and that we trust you. We do commit this time to your glory this afternoon as we honor our friend and our loved one, C.H., and we pray in Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing Rock of Ages, which was personally requested by C.H., read a rather lengthy passage from John chapter 11, so if you'd like to grab a Bible in front of you and follow along, you're certainly welcome to do so. The Apostle John writes at the beginning of the chapter, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. 
So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Beginning again in verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And Jesus asked, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept and the Jews said, see how he loved him. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, that death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art, which was also requested by C.H.
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home with joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then As I mentioned before, we're going to take a few minutes here this afternoon to remember C.H. And uh, C.H.'s son, Larry, is going to share some thoughts first, and then I will share some thoughts on Pete's behalf. And then we'd like to give you an opportunity to share what you would like to share. Hello there. I'm Lawrence Charles Gross, usually known as Larry, the oldest son of Charles Hewitt Gross III, always known as C.H., Okay, close to my mouth. Uh, I have a younger brother named Paul or Patrick or something. Uh, <laughs> Peter, that's it. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, to be complete, and since this is being recorded, so she'll probably see it, we also have a younger sister named Susan who's in Massachusetts. Hello, Sue. I'm here to talk about the kind of man that our father was. I never asked him what his philosophy of life was, but I think if I had, he would have answered something like, get it done and get it done right. By the way, that's why my comment's written down, so I don't forget something and get it wrong. He was born during the Depression in September 1930 in the sleepy village of Boston Spa, New York, to the third generation publisher of the local newspaper, the Boston Journal. As his full name implies, uh, he has the same name as his grandfather and father, who also hired two more Charleses to work in the family business. Initially, uh, his family called him Huey, after his middle name. But living in a sea of Charleses, one of the employee Charles suggested to my father when my father was in college that maybe you should call yourself C.H. to stand out. And my father took it like a fish to water. In later years, he would use that name exclusively, often fighting bureaucracies uh, who, ins who insisted on a regular first name. And those are battles he sometimes won and sometimes lost. Just this week, when we were trying to fill out his, uh, when we were filing for his death certificate, we had, Peter and I had no clue how he was listed with Social Security. We had to make a whole bunch of searching through records and calls to local Social Security office before we could actually legally file to have him declared dead. I remember more than one person asked him repeatedly what his real name was, and he always universally said C.H. In later years, one of his employees, who had not grown up with the business, was sure that that C stood for some horrific name. And she begged me to tell him what it really was. I'm sure she'd fall for all kinds of bribes. But I was getting ready, uh, my father was going to help pay for my college education. And I knew which side of the bread, you know, which side my bread was buttered on. So I turned her down flat. <laughs> my dad not only wanted to get things done right, he wanted to get things done right his way. He was very physically active when he was younger. But, as a struggle, but he was a struggling student. The physical side was best exemplified by his enthusiastic involvement with the Boy Scouts, which included being a leader in his early 20s and coordinating scout trips to National Jamborees. Maybe you saw a picture there of all these tents in the distance. That was a National Jamboree where he led the local scout troop in the early 50s. He loved the physical side of scouting, including camping, and his one disappointment was that he was not able to become an Eagle Scout because at that time there was a, manda you had a, was a mandatory requirement for a swimming and life-saving badge, and he had serious ear trouble. 
So he could, literally could not put his head below water without it being a life-threatening situation. When I reached the age where I could become a Boy Scout, my dad waxed eloquently about the joys and wonders of outdoor life with the Scouts, to which I reacted with sheer horror, being an avid bookworm. Uh, Brian commented on the suits and how dad would want uh, people to dress. You're absolutely right. As you can see, my dad and I did not always see eye to eye. <laughs> he insisted that I had to spend a minimum of one year in the Boy Scouts, which included a full week or, a week or two weeks, whatever it was, of going to you know, scout camp and camping outdoors and getting the full exposure. The first the day after I fulfilled my commitment, I quit the scouts. I even, I'd, earned a second, I'd earned a second class badge. I didn't even bother going back to collect it, <laughs> which is something he was deeply disappointed by. A major cause of his school struggle, struggles was that in spite of studying very, very hard, he suffered from poor hearing nearly all his life, following a bout of major scarlet fever when he was young. That caused, that caused the ear problems I referred to before. Uh, his, eventually, in college, he went through several surgeries that were not correct things, and in college he finally got a hearing aid. And he was, I read his memoirs, he was astonished of how the whole world opened up to him. And the last year or two of college, his grades surged up because he finally could understand what was going on. His hearing loss was of a, such a type that he could not use a traditional in-the-ear hearing aid. So I don't know, some of you may have very briefly seen for most of his life, he had this band, a metal band across the top of his head, which then connected to a receiver in the middle of his chest. Um, it always reminded me of something out of my favorite Martian, personally, when I looked at it. I always enjoyed watching someone who did not know him well, for the first time, watch him answer a telephone. Because normally you'd have the phone like this. Because his receiver was in the middle of the chest, he would answer the phone like this. And people were sure it was a practical joke, but it wasn't. That was the only way that he could talk into a telephone, or listen to a telephone. After college, he dabbled with a state job in Albany, even tried law school in New York City, which he did not complete, obviously, and had a job with AT&T in New York City. But he finally came back home to our small town to join the hometown family newspaper and printing business. He spent more time helping out on the printing side uh, growing up. He started out at 10 years old as a linotype operator. There's some pictures of him out there uh, at 10 cents an hour. So it would have been about, about 1940. I mean, we have so things on the table related to that. He enjoyed the work, but was a bit resentful when his two younger brothers started out later at 25 cents an hour. When he worked full time, he expected to continue on the printing side, but he eventually transitioned into the newspaper side of the business. And at the age 27, nearly 100 years after his great-grandfather had bought the paper, he became the publisher. Shortly after, he married the high school librarian, Judy Jorgensen, and shortly before, they had me. He focused on the business side rather than reporting, which were the editor's responsibilities. But he did decide, shortly after he started the paper, to uh, do a weekly column where he would just express his thoughts on anything. Uh, and it became known as From the Publisher's Desk and ran for 20 years. The topics could cover literally almost anything, although his most frequent topics were complaining about the New York State Legislature in Albany and New York Telephone. But he did sometimes do personal things in his column. And I, was always, I know I personally was always thrilled whenever my name showed up, which wasn't frequently. Uh, we have four examples out on the table. His first column, his last column, and the two columns that refer to Peter's and my birth. The column he wrote about my birth turned out Interesting enough to be one of the most controversial of the whole 20 years. He mentions in his memoirs that I think he received more angry letters about that specific uh, publisher's desk column than any other. And I'll let you glance at it, see if you can figure out why. Uh, we also included some birth announcements that, that he printed up for Peter and I. And you should read those and you get a little bit of a sense of his, his sense of humor. The first several years as a publisher were tough. He often butted heads with longtime employees or his relatives. Uh, he, Shortly moved to Johnstown, New York, about 40 miles away, and decided to start a paper, paper completely from scratch. And he loved that experience. He really enjoyed being in charge. Uh, so much so that he became much more insistent on that when he came back to Boston in the late 60s, complete with three kids. By that time, he was running multiple uh, newspapers out of multiple offices. Uh, and then my mother, Judy, our, our mother, Judy, died in 1971. And not long after that, he married the editor of one of those papers, the Scotia paper, uh, Edith 
Geertsen Hogan, who then became known as Kate Gross. Thus, so the combined, they tried to confuse bureaucracies everywhere. <laughs> In part so they could work together out of, this, out of the same location, they decided to consolidate all of the newspaper operations into one place. And they decided to search for a building where they could have the newspaper on the first floor and the family would be on the second floor. After searching for a while, they ended up on a house and a location that's known as 72 West High Street. And there's a few pictures on the table, including when they tried to, sold it later on, and it, it shows up in the background of many of the family pictures. Uh, it was huge. And speaking as someone who's responsible for weekly chores, I can tell you it was a, it was a bear to maintain. Um, the, there was a magnificent house. It was originally built in 1831, and then it became a real showpiece after it was remodeled in 1906 for the local town bank president. Um, it was a rather, a rather unusual layout inside because it had been converted to five apartments before my father bought it, but my parents were extremely proud of it, and it definitely fit their attitude of doing things right. As all these changes were happening, not everyone agreed with my dad, and he had little hesitation in firing anyone who did not do things right his way. I believe my brother Peter and I share the record of having been fired the most times by my father, <laughs> twice each. Uh, fortunately, we each got a third opportunity to work, to work for him, but that was not out of any sense of family love or loyalty. It was because as a shrewd businessman and just like his father before him, he valued dirt cheap labor. <laughs> Both of us started out at 25 cents an hour, uh, which was so excessive back when he was growing up. Uh, my dad and I had more than one vigorous discussion on the exact meaning of the minimum wage law, <laughs> which I invariably lost. To be fair, my dad was absolutely no slouch. His normal routine was to get up, at, once we had moved in there, he would get up at 3 or, three or 4 o'clock in the morning, go downstairs to start work for about two to three hours, come up for breakfast, then put in a full day's work, and then after supper, frequently proofread copy with, my, with our mother in the living room. After my dad remarried, he and my stepmother did everything together. After moving to our new home, they shared the same office together. They walked every day five blocks to the post office to get the business mail. Their first roadblock when they came to decide what, how to exercise together. My dad loved to downhill ski. We lived near the Adirondack Mountains in New York and the Green Mountains in Vermont, and there were numerous opportunities to ski. On the other hand, my stepmother liked to play tennis. They both tried each other's sport, and I suspect my dad tried to figure out there's a way to combine the two. But what they eventually ended up settling on was golf. And uh, they, they loved to golf. They, they golfed numerous, they became members of the local club and golfed in numerous locations throughout the area. Uh, my mother was an average player. She would have relatively short drives that go straight down the course. My dad, on the other hand, would launch these booming drives that would soar majestically into the sky just before they hooked to the right and into the trees, never to be seen by human eyes again. <laughs> I sometimes wondered if he had invested stock in the company that made Titleist golf balls, because he seemed determined to keep them in business single-handedly. <laughs> Needless to say, he was a terrible player and usually lost to my mother, but he didn't care. It was a way that it, the fact they could do it together outweighed needing to visit the pro shop every week for another dozen golf balls. Their love of golf led them to own first a condominium and later a cottage in Pinehurst, North Carolina, which they loved deeply and visited several times a year for 15 years uh, before great-grandchildren started showing up and they decided they needed to stay home in New York more. He had a personal desire to retire from the business at age 50, which he did not quite make, but when he was either 52 or 53, he did sell the business to one of my stepbrothers, Charles Hogan, uh, who, who took over the business at that point. Dad really provided advice and consulting, but he never worked full-time after that. One instance that especially impressed me about my father in the years that followed was when I was in my late 20s. My parents had come to visit me in Minneapolis for Christmas one year. My mother went to bed early, and my dad stayed up late to talk with me. By that time, I was well-established in my career as a computer programmer, having had a number of large raises and other commendations. And my father admitted he had misunderstood me when I was growing up. As I've implied, he was a hard-driving, hard-charging type A personality. I've sometimes described myself as a type B squared. And needless to say, we didn't see eye to eye at almost any point when I was growing up. And he was convinced 
And he told me frequently that I was, I was going to turn into a lazy good-for-nothing unless I got my act together and started working harder. Even graduating at the top of my small-town high school did not impress him in the least. Because he knew my study habits and he didn't think I studied hard enough to deserve such good grades. What he admitted to me in Minneapolis was that he finally realized we had totally different personalities. And even though I wasn't like him, there were environments in which some of my personality could thrive and flourish and make a major contribution without being that hard-charging, driving type that he was. He did not apologize often, but I knew that was a significant revelation for him, and it definitely drew us closer. I've always appreciated and respected him for both recognizing it and being willing to tell me that. Retiring didn't mean he didn't stay active. In addition to more frequent golfing with my mother, he was an avid gardener. He and my mother traveled extensively, especially in North Carolina. And he regularly chopped his own wood in the backyard so they could enjoy a fire, a wood fire, every night during the winter months. He was by far in better shape in his mid-60s than I was in my mid-30s. That all changed in 1998. First, he had serious heart problems, which were eventually diagnosed as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which meant he had an extra nerve from his brain to his heart, which started short-circuiting and causing extremely dangerously rapid heartbeats. Surgery corrected that, but when I came home not long after that, in June of 1998, for the newspaper's 200th anniversary and my cousin Jenna's wedding, uh, he talked to me that he was having some odd symptoms that he couldn't explain. He was having some problems with his balance, and he couldn't seem to use his fingers quite as finally as he normally would, and the doctors had no clue what it was. Four and a half years later, he called me for my birthday, which falls around Thanksgiving, and was delighted to tell me that he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. For most people, that would be terrifying news, but for my father, he liked knowing what was happening, so we can now start doing something about it, something concrete about it. It's very hard to get things done right when you have no clue what's going on or what the causes are, and that they now knew. And he definitely took a step upward in improvement after that diagnosis was made. But one side effect was that they're no longer able to maintain that huge house on West High Street. I mean, even after, his, even after he was having these problems, he would still hang out the, the windows on the up tall second story and wash the windows on the outside, which horrified the relatives who were begging him to sell the place. And they finally agreed to do that. Uh, especially since by that point my stepmother had, be, uh, had macular de degeneration and was nearly blind. So he finally decided to sell after living there over 30 years. And there's a copy of the sales brochure uh, out on the table that gives uh, more details on the house. Because they were very specific in their needs, they insisting having things done right their way, they decided to build a brand new house on the, uh, just north of town in a new development. And my dad told me that the, the contractor they were working with, at that point, my mom was in her mid-80s and dad was 72. And the contractor said he had never worked with a couple that old, because at that age, most people are moving out of a single-family house. And they were moving in, but for them, it was a massive downsize. Uh, however, it worked out very well for them, uh, but it was only a temporary solution. Five years later, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and passed away within a year. We were, the family was worried how dad would react because they had literally done everything together. I've never, I've never seen a couple that did as much together as they did. And he had some hard days, but he, but he also was looking forward. He took advantage of traveling again to visit uh, relatives and friends, which he had not been able to do to at least, for at least 10 years due to my mother's blindness. He came to Minneapolis twice, Iowa, Virginia twice, Tennessee, Colorado that I know of, plus a lot of local driving trips. And he really wrecked up the frequent flyer miles. But even then, Parkinson's kept its progress and started to catch up with him. Uh, when mom died, uh, Peter and Raylene uh, offered that if he wanted to, he could move in with them so there's someone to take care of him. He initially turned them down, but shortly after his 80th birthday, when he was, he was finding, I think it took like an hour and a half for him to put his socks on, he realized maybe he needed a little help. And he took them up on their offer and moved out here five years ago. He spent the next four and a half years with Pete and Raylene, and his health at first uh, definitely improved. And I think a, a lot of it was due to the lack of stress and seeing so him do things for himself. And I know that being able to be regularly around his grandkids and later grandkids-in-law and eventually great-grandkids was a real boost to his morale and a real joy for him. As his oldest child, he asked me to be his executor many years ago. We had infrequent discussions, we had infrequent discussions about this when he was in New York. 
but after he moved to Iowa, he decided to be a little more serious about his plans. And so he gave me about roughly six documents that defined what he wanted to happen after he died, who to contact, you know, what his bank accounts were, what his computer passwords were. And every time I came down here, he'd give me two or three more pages as, as there were updates to those documents. And I filed them away and put them all here. And these were all of the things that he gave me to prepare for his death. Uh, even in his dying, he insisted that things would get done and get done right. Let's see, that was that page. Unfortunately, his lifelong battle with his hearing took a major, shit, a major hit shortly after he came here, and the type of hearing aid he had used for 60 years uh, was no longer effective. Uh, he had a cochlear, cochlear implant done, which helped him hear noises, but he was not able to convert them to words unless he could see the person talking and could lip read. He was reasonably good at this, but it, meant it, but it only worked when he was dealing with one or two people at a time. So if those of you have interacted with him in a group and he seemed very withdrawn, that was because he simply could not interact with people on a large scale, which I know disappointed him, although he enjoyed even being there sometimes and watching the activity swirl around him, even though he could not, no longer participate in it. One of the ways he compensated was to continue his voracious love of reading. He regularly read the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, the local paper, and a daily paper from upstate New York. Whenever I visited, uh, he would usually ask me to take him to the Marion Library so he could check out five to six more books, which he would consume in the next two weeks and then start the process over again. He even read the Bible cover to cover uh, at least once while he was here, and I think possibly twice, uh, something he had not done for many years because he was too busy being active. But Parkinson's continued its inevitable progress, and he reached a point last year where he needed more help than Pete and Raylene and even their son, uh, sons Ben help, which meant a nursing home which Pete and I you know, agreed on, and Dad reluctantly agreed on as well. Fortunately, they found a place that was only a mile away where Pete could visit regularly. And, and Dad, I think, understood while he was there, uh, and he was fine with the care, but he complained frequently about the cost. And then after he would complain, about, and I would come and visit uh, more frequently while he was there, he would complain to me about the cost, and he would, and he would get up, go over to the computer, uh, check his email on Yahoo, read the, read the Schenectady Gazette, uh, download his latest financials on Quicken, and then you know, talk to me about the pros and cons of upgrading his computer to Windows 10, all in the nursing home. <laughs> For the record, we did do the, that upgrade last Thanksgiving. <laughs> the last time I visited him was three weeks ago, and one of the primary purposes was to work on his 2015 taxes together. Uh, his mind was sharp, but his fingers were having a hard, tough time with the keyboard and just the intricacy of the keyboard, so he needed someone to help him with that, with the typing. After I finished my first pass, we took a look at his 1040 results, and he compared it to the Quicken, out, uh, Quicken report that he had printed out, and he quickly noted there were several discrepancies. And I spent an hour going back and forth trying to you know, debate with him. Well, I, don't, I think that's I think, you know, I think it's the problem with the tax program. No, this is the problem with, with Quicken. And it took us at least an hour to get all the discrepancies resolved before he was satisfied with the results. To the very end, he wanted to get things done and get them done right. I love you, Dad, and I will miss you as will your entire family. And we will do our best to see that your legacy of getting things done and getting them done right continues. Thank you. Well, I learned some things there. Thank you, Larry. Um, just before the service started, I was out in the foyer. I was reading CH's memoirs that Larry referred to. And uh, specifically, I had just read about Larry's birth and the controversy. So I do encourage you to check that out. It's at the far corner of the table down there. It's scandalous. Uh, it's also good to know where, where uh, Pete's golf slice comes from. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> well, uh, Pete's had a difficult week, as you can imagine, an emotional week. And uh, because that's been hard for him, he just asked that I would share his thoughts about his dad, which I'm going to try to do here. Pete, I have to tell you, when I was reading through this before the service started, um, I had difficulty getting through this, so I apologize if, uh, if I get emotional as well. Pete begins by describing memories that he has of his father. I have some fond memories of Dad, which include playing pitch and catch sometimes with a baseball, delivering Sunday morning newspapers where each made a delivery on our side of the street at the same time and race back to the station wagon to see who got back first. Once my Cub Scout, Dan, took a tour of the Boston Journal office, and Dad was demonstrating how to use the linotype machine, 
which made pieces that looked like this. This is kind of a heavy piece of lead. It was Dad doing the demo, and I thought I knew what was going on around the print shop. Dad thought I was too much of a hot dog, so after getting done with a newly typed slug, he put the slug in his hand and proceeded to give it to me. Since it was still hot off the press, literally, I screamed and dropped it because it was too hot. Dad always thought that was a good lesson in humility. He wrote me a letter when I was 10, summarizing the first decade of my life. He highlighted the challenges of mom dying that year and also reminded me that he loved me. I enjoyed going on a ski vacation to Switzerland when I was 11. When I was 19, I accidentally broke my stepmom's china teapot. In that incident, I had said a lie which he caught me with. He proceeded to tell me that he loved me, but he did not want me to lie to him. It was the first time I had remembered him verbally stating his love for me. He wrote a letter again when I was 21, summarizing my second decade and providing some guidance for the next. Perhaps my most cherished memory is having Dad live with us the last five years of his life here in Iowa. Pete goes on to describe lessons that he learned from his father, some direct and some indirect. Some of those included being a gentleman to ladies by seating my stepmom at the dinner table each night and always opening the door for her. Raylene, how is he doing? Okay? All right. Another lesson was working hard. My passion for working hard at raking leaves for youth group or core fundraisers came from my dad. The next lesson was being frugal. I think we heard that from Larry as well. The lesson of planning and the lesson of learning that I could usually do more than I thought I could do. Pete goes on to write, I am amazed at how many of my dad's various decisions have shaped the course of my life. Many of them I did not like or agree with at first. But a hindsight look at most of these decisions have created in me a deep appreciation for how they have benefited my life as well as given me a better understanding of who God is and what he is like. Dad decided before us kids were born that we could not take over the family business. At first I resented not having the chance to continue the newspaper business. But in hindsight, I realized that it was not a career that I would have enjoyed. When I was in fourth grade, he decided that I should not participate in the Iowa basic skills test like the rest of my grade because he felt it was not a good measurement of education. I remember sitting in the library all day long reading John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage, while my classmates were testing. I did not understand what was wrong with the test. We lived four hours from New York City, and Dad decided to only go to one baseball game in the summer. Because Larry was a Mets fan, we took turns going to see the Yankees and the Mets. If my dad had been smarter and had been a Yankees fan, we could have seen the Yankees every year. <laughs> dad decided we should graduate in three years from high school and get on with our education since high school had a lot of wasted time from his perspective. That meant that my brother and I were 16 when we graduated. I was ready to leave the nest and move on. Dad asked me as a junior in high school what I wanted to do for a career. I said I wanted to be a pastor. Dad said he would not help me financially if that's what I wanted to do because he did not think that I would make a good pastor. I remember being very upset by this news and I went to my room after supper and cried. Dad realized how difficult it was for me and made a compromise. He asked me to try a different field at a regular college first. If I still wanted to be a pastor, then he would help me. In hindsight, I'm glad for that decision because I was not ready to be a pastor at that stage of my life. Dad decided I had to go at least 500 miles away for college and that I could not attend the same college as my brother. That's how I ended up at Iowa State from New York. It was simply a school far enough away from home. I've appreciated the results of moving away from home. It worked out extremely well for my brother and myself. Dad thought I was crazy to quit my job at Rockwell Collins, a good job as a manager, 
to be a full-time pastor. He later told me how glad he was that I had the flexibility as a pastor to be with him as I needed to in order to help him. The most significant thing I take from my dad's life is learning about God and his loving hand that is sovereign over all the difficulties of life and also sovereign over the shortcoming of parents. The first time I started to see this was after the death of my mother when I was nine. I started to ask God questions like, what happened to my mom? What will happen to me when I die? When I was 13, I was invited to a youth group by a friend where I accepted Christ as my Savior. I had found God's love despite the most difficult circumstance of my mother passing away. But I can best illustrate God's sovereignty by a series of events that started with a bucket. One day in the summer after I graduated, I was doing my assigned cleaning chores of mopping the kitchen and bathroom floors. When I was done with the bucket, I poured the dirty water into the bathtub. I put the bucket down to rinse the grit in the bathtub. The bucket was outside the bathtub, next to the closet door, in the bathroom where it was supposed to go. I then forgot to put the bucket in the closet and proceeded to the Boston Country Club to play some golf. When Dad found out that I had not completed my chores before playing golf, he grounded me for three weeks. I can make an easy case for the punishment not fitting the crime, but I would be missing the bigger picture of the benefit that came out of this situation. In protest of the unfair punishment, I biked to a friend's house when I thought I could get away with it. But I got caught and was then grounded for the rest of the summer. As a result, I was unable to watch my cousin Andy perform in Godspell that summer. That fall, I went to college at Iowa State. The first week of school, Godspell was playing. Since I missed it in the summer, I still wanted to see it, but it was sold out. Earlier that day, I had received an invitation to a Bible study, but had declined. After I found out that God's spell was sold out, I decided to accept the invitation. As a result, I met some good Christian friends, which in turn landed me at a good church while in college, which in turn helped me to grow as a Christian, which in turn help prepare me to eventually be a pastor. The words of Romans 8.28 could not ring louder in my ears, that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Growing up, we can grumble a lot about the shortcomings of our parents. That is not hard to do. What is hard and more important is to see how God takes care of those who love him even if the parents are doling out punishments not in accordance with the crime. God used that bucket that I did not move six inches in a significant way in my life. I grew to appreciate God's instruction in Ephesians 6 to honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. I have a much greater appreciation for God's sovereignty and love for me as a result of my dad. And for that, I am truly grateful. We want to give the rest of you an opportunity, if you would like, to uh, share any memories that you have of CH. Uh, maybe I would just ask that you stand where you're at and, uh, and go ahead and share. <clears throat> This microphone always makes me cry, even on open mic times, but I'll try not to. So um, when CH's wife passed away and he was alone with Parkinson's, um, it was becoming obvious to us that he was not going to be able to live alone. And uh, I suggested to Pete that we could have him live with us, and Pete's like, oh, he'd never do that. But I still invited CH a couple times and insisted we meant it. And, of course, he didn't want to. I think he thought we were crazy people and didn't really want to come live with us. Uh, but one fateful Sunday afternoon, he called and asked if the offer was good. And I said yes. And then I was scared. Michelle remembers. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Pete went to get him, and I was like, what are we getting into? Um, and as you might guess, when hard-headed... CH meets hard-headed, red-headed daughter-in-law. There were a few, <laughs> a few sparks. But 
he also told me he appreciated me and my hard-headedness and uh, keeping him on track. You know, somebody has to do that. So uh, we had some fun times, he and I, going down to the U to, to take him for his hearing tests, and then we would often go eat at Stella, which is a favorite restaurant that we had. And um, I do remember when his hearing was starting to go bad, he was stubborn as he was, um, insistent not, you know, that he could hear well enough and I shouldn't just write to him because he was, I think, a little embarrassed. But we went to dinner one night, just he and I, and I took a notebook and started writing to him. And um, <clears throat> the conversation just really opened up and he really enjoyed sharing some stuff. We had a real conversation because when I wrote, he could understand. And that, so that was good. And just another example where the daughter-in-law was right. I mean... <laughs> Um, and another fond memory is uh, he really liked PBS, and Downton Abbey became very popular, so we binged on Downton Abbey on Netflix, and it was kind of fun because Pete would fall asleep, and then we'd finish the episode, and I'd look at CH and be like, one more? And he'd like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of fun that way. So I really appreciated having him here for five years and getting to know him a lot better than I would have if I had, you know, never invited him to come. So the moral of the story is invite your elderly parents to come live with you if you really want to have some fun. I uh, really only knew CH for the five years that he was in Cedar Rapids, but uh, uh, when, he, uh, when he first came, I was struck by uh, how interesting he is. People, people with a journalism and newspapering background why? Oh. Uh, you know, people with a, a newspapering and journalism background are often very interesting to talk to, and C.H. was really no exception. He had a very whimsical sense of humor. He had an incisive mind. And uh, was really easy to talk to because he'd ask a lot of questions. He was curious and fascinated by people. Just people. C.H. really loved people. So he found out that I had grown up on a farm and we talked a lot about agriculture and, and kind of kept the topics for my ease, I guess, or whatever. I kind of stick, stuck to topics at first that I was interested in. So we talked about agriculture and milking cows and food production and, and different things like that. And we later on moved into uh, things like uh, uh, national and world politics and I often walked away from those conversations feeling like C.H. and I had really solved one or two of the world's problems, you know? C.H. <laughs> uh, uh, was, uh, 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 was just a, a really interesting guy in that respect. Um, another uh, uh, angle on, on C.H. that I've often been impressed by was that he, uh, he let Pete and Larry know when it was time for him to come and, and uh, live with Pete or when he needed their assistance. I, I hope I'm humble enough and able to do that, able to do the best I can to make it easy for my kids if and when I get to the point where I need that. And, and conversely, uh, uh, you know your kids, honoring your parents, uh, there's a verse in the Bible, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, it says, children, uh, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Uh, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you, you may enjoy long life and happy days. Um, these are verses that I taught my kids right away, okay? Because I want my kids to honor me. Don't we all want our kids to honor us? Um, but uh, it, it's a verse actually for adults. Who, who may have the opportunity to honor their parents in this manner in the future. Uh, my, kids, uh, my kids know me like no one else really does. They know what will make me happy, you know? They also know what will put me in a rage. They, uh, they've seen me in different kinds of moods. They know how much money I make. They've seen me in my underwear. And uh, my kids could come up with a lot of reasons not to honor me. And I think that's probably true of everybody in this room, if we really wanted to. But the scripture doesn't say to use that as a benchmark for evaluating. 
The scripture says to honor your parents, for this is right. So why do we do this? We do this, to, we honor our parents because God says it's right. That's the end of the story. There's no other evaluation, no other critical point necessary. Some of you have experienced this already. Some of you are going to have to die to yourselves in that way. And, and personally, I would like to thank Larry and Kathy and Pete and Raylene for the example that they've set over the last five years of honoring a parent who truly needed them. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that, that was really good. And I'll, I'll just conclude by simply saying, well done. My name is Jenna Huther. I'm the daughter of Pete and Raylene, so I would be CH's uh, step-granddaughter. And um, I didn't really know him much when we were growing up, but I did in the last five years when he lived in my parents' home, obviously. And so I have two memories I wanted to share. And um, he and I enjoyed a lot of laughs together when we were able to understand each other and when we weren't able to understand each other. Um, so the first one I wanted to share was, I remember one time we were sitting in the living room and um, I lived at their house for about six months in between getting married I got engaged and we weren't able to live together yet, so I lived at my parents. And um, in that, th that time, we watched a lot of TV together and just hung out. And I remember we were sitting in the living room and you never really knew his train of thought because out of the blue, he would say something. So out of the blue, he told me a story from his childhood. He said that when he was in grade school, he had a teacher that was making a big um, to-do about how people never wore anything made at home anymore, that everything was mass produced. And this was when CH was in grade school. And so he, um, he said that, it, to make her point, the teacher called on him and said, where was your sweater made? And his sweater was homemade. And so he <laughs> told her that, I don't remember, it was his mom or his aunt who had made the sweater. And he was so proud of how he got back at his teacher that he was telling me that story <laughs> in his 80s. And so we had a laugh about that. And then later, um, uh, after I got married, uh, there was a time where my husband and I bought a house. And we um, had a couple of days between where we had to be out of our apartment, but we couldn't be in our house yet. And so we moved back in um, with Pete and Raylene for a couple of nights. And so when I came in, I was carrying a piece of cake and I said to CH, I said, um, hey, did you hear we're living with you for a few days? And his response was, no thanks, I already brushed my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't bother to clarify though, because I didn't want to share my cake. So those are my memories of CH. My name is Ben, CH was my grandfather. Um, thank you all, first I would like to say, for being with us today. Uh, it's kind of the end of an era for us, so we're glad you could help us uh, celebrate his life. Um, there's a couple things that stand out to me about um, the time I experienced with my grandfather, and that wasn't a lot of time. I could probably count the uh, encounters I'd had with him um, as a child or through my teenage years on less than these five fingers. Um, the first one that stands out to me was being eight years old. And my brother John and I, he, he was seven at the time, we went to Boston Spa and got to stay at the huge uh, West High Street house um, that you could easily get lost in. Um, and one day with grandpa's permission, him and I were allowed to um, uh, wander around downtown Boston and, and we got lost. And <laughs> It, that, that's a feat in itself, because Boston's this big. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we didn't know what to do, and we didn't want to call him. He gave us his phone number, and he's like, you need anything? Call me. Here's a quarter. Go to a payphone. That was in the days of payphones. Um, but Grandpa did have a reputation as a hard-charging guy, and as an 8-year-old, uh, I didn't know... Uh, what his reaction would be essentially. So I ended up calling my mom. So we called mom, mom called grandpa, grandpa picked us up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I realized that there, there was more to grandpa uh, than I had previously thought that day. Um, Cause I expected him to yell at me or something and instead he's just like, I'm, I'm glad you're okay. So that, that was probably my earliest memory of him. Um, another time that sticks out would be at about 15. I think I was 15. Um, when we helped him move to Citation Way. I think that's how old I was. I'm not, I don't have perfect memory of that. Um, but the biggest thing that stood out to me was cleaning out his attic. Um, and his house was so big, it, had, it did smell. Um, 
uh, his attic was big and just a little scary. It, it should have been the set of a horror movie or something. I, I, I did not enjoy going up there. Um, and I guess as a, a third thing I remember, uh, the list is pretty short. I think I was 22. I would have been a senior in college. And um, I had the opportunity to go uh, stay with him for a week at the house he ended up moving into. So he left the West High Street house and went into something much more manageable um, to live by himself. I forget if, I think Grandma Kate was there maybe for a couple years, for five years. Um, so it got to a point where he could take care of himself fairly well, but he couldn't take care of the house. And so I, I spent a week there and, um, you know, did all kind of chores. I pulled weeds, I gathered brush, um, you know, power washed the side of his house. I painted his basement stairs. And in return, what he did for me, uh, he said, you know, good job. Um, I guess I, I kind of skipping a couple of details. That was the first time as an adult I got to spend any time with him. I didn't really grow up around him. So that was special just to drive around, um, eat junk food, watch TV together, and just shoot the breeze. It was a great time. Um, but in return for my week of service, he ended up giving me vintage Ray-Bans. These were like 30 or 40 years old, and, and I thought I was uptown with those. I thought I did. They were so cool. I thought I was, you know, Tom Cruise in Top Gun or something. <laughs> And uh, so he gave me those the night before I went home, and I wore them to the airport, in the airport, on the flight. I'm like, I'm never going to take these off again. <laughs> and I did something stupid, which was leave those sunglasses in the um, seat back compartment of the airplane. Yes, I did. And um, I lost them. And I got off a connecting flight and realized what I'd done, and it was only 20 minutes later that I went back to the airplane, and they were gone. So somebody thought they were cooler than I did, apparently. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I never saw those again. So to my eternal shame, I lost those. And I, that was a, a good gift for, uh, uh, for the time I ended up helping him that week. Um, but that's basically it. I, I wish I had known uh, him more. And um, I'm glad that I was able to sort of redeem that time as an adult. This last summer, I had the um, great pleasure of being his caregiver. So um, my dad and Raylene gave him the option of finding help to come into the house or him going to a nursing home, and he elected to, to employ me for, I think it was 10 weeks. That was some of the best time I ever had. Grandpa and I hung out every day. That was a great time. Um, it, it was a difficult time. You know, he was aging and needed a lot of help, but um, it was a great uh, pleasure of mine to get to know him. That's, that's not a time I really had before that at all. And if one day stood out more than any other, it was, I think, probably the last time he took a road trip. Uh, him and I got in the car, and we drove to Palisades Park, and he didn't want to hike, so we, we kind of just drove around for about 10 minutes and left, but it was good for him to see the sights and get out of the house, because he, he didn't really leave the house. Um, and then we started driving north and kind of just got lost on purpose. We, we hit uh, some county roads, we saw farms and um, cornfields, and really just talked, and I think that was the last time he left the house, so um, I'm glad I was able to share that with him. And I think the thing I will grow into appreciating more and more all the time was having, I think, one of his last coherent conversations um, with him that he ever had. I, it would have been two Fridays ago. So before he got uh, very sick, uh, he was able to hold a conversation. And I think it was maybe the second to last one ever. So uh, that's something I'll look back uh, on with much fondness, I'm sure. Um, but he, he was a great guy, and I'm glad you all can be here today to, uh, to celebrate his passing, uh, to commemorate his life, and just be with us. So thank you very much. Well, we are a family of talkers, apparently. So um, Some things I remember about my grandpa, you know, just same as Ben, you don't not spending a lot of time with somebody when you're young, you just don't get to choose what you remember and just lots of scattered things. I remember he had a garden. I remember he worked in it. I remember having an Italian dinner on Saturday night. But, you know, Sam got to know him quite a bit better uh, when he moved down. Some of the things I'm grateful for are all the genetic gifts that ended up skipping a generation. So <laughs> he was deaf, but he wasn't colorblind, so he didn't have two matching kinds of plaid. Um, <laughs> he, uh, 
he he had a uh, a full palate on his tongue, so I appreciated that. You know, he uh, enjoyed quite a bit of um, quite a bit of food. But uh, you know, knowing him later in life, it was really interesting because he became kind of like a man full of contradictions. Where you know, as interested as he was in politics, he lived at a home where we just don't debate politics, but we're all very comfortable talking and debating. Um, you know, he, he came and lived with us, and you'd ask him, well, what would you like to eat? I don't care. You pick, you know. He, he cared. He just, just didn't want to fight about it. He didn't want to insert himself, and maybe he was just getting old. I don't know. But one of the things that's been sticking out to me, thinking about it, is, you know, I've heard him say that he just doesn't regret. Like, <clears throat> he just doesn't regret the choices that he made in life. And, uh, which is interesting, because I think that's probably true. I think he made the choices he wanted to make. And, um, and he learned to live with the consequences of them, you know, both good and bad. And, but I think one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, that's so freeing, but it's also, um, I don't know, there's something about being human that is to be full of shame and regret. And, uh, I think without, the relief of Christ, which I don't think he had. I don't know. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure he ever fully was able to reconcile all that regret. So, <laughs> um, I think I'll just remember him fondly and uh, just be so grateful for the time I had with him. Like you guys, I don't really have many memories of my grandfather. Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, I don't have many memories. Uh, I guess I'll just share one. It stood out and kind of made me the man I am today. Um, I got into a lot of trouble when I was 18, and I lived with uh, Dad and Ray. And about three weeks before I moved into the current house uh, we're at, uh, I had my only time I was ever alone with CH. Like, ever. Weird. Um, and he, I just confessed to him that I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was scared. And he told me, a man does not sit. A man does not relax. He chases his dreams. He works hard. He takes care of the people he loves. And he did that. Tenfold, all the way. Okay, I'll share a brief thought, and then we'll invite Pastor Kurt to come on up and share some thoughts as well. Obviously, I only knew CH the, uh, for the few years that he was here in Cedar Rapids uh, after he moved in with Pete and Raylene. Uh, first, I'm not sure that I ever heard CH call Pete Pete. It was always Peter, and I noticed that Larry, uh, if he didn't call him Paul, called him Peter. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't joking earlier when I said that I specifically wore a suit because it was the kind of thing that I think C.H. would appreciate. Uh, he was a man of propriety. And one of the things that I appreciated about C.H., particularly when he was still uh, able to hear some, is that when he would come to church on Sunday mornings and when I would have the occasion to teach on Sunday mornings, afterwards he was always very quick to shake my hand, thank you for my teaching, and Tell me that I did a good job. I don't know if he understood what I was teaching, and I don't know if he appreciated the doctrine of my message. Perhaps it was just that he uh, enjoyed my speaking style. But nevertheless, it was always very encouraging for CH to tell me that he appreciated something that I had to offer. And uh, in visiting with CH at Pete and Raylene's house, it was always that, well, uh, that way as well quick to say hello, to shake your hand, to welcome you, and to invite you into his circle. So I appreciated that very much. Kurt? I was asked to give a, a brief message on John chapter 11. It'll be about 15 minutes long, so if you can hang in there. I didn't know the grocers were so wordy. I just didn't know that. And funny. I really appreciate all that you guys shared. I really did. Very, very helpful. What I do have to say is shortened a little bit by what Mike said, because I would have said the same things. Uh, CH, I just appreciated the opportunities I had to sit down and talk with him. 
because he was a very interesting, he was a very knowledgeable man. I enjoy talking to smart people, and C.H. was a very smart man. And you could talk to him about anything, religion, politics, geography, history, and uh, immigration. I mean, he just, he could talk to you. And it was very enjoyable. The second thing is, and I hope, I think this is appropriate to just say how uh, encouraged I am by the example of Pete and Raylene and Ben in taking care of C.H. I, I think it's okay to say that probably wasn't always an easy thing. And uh, the amount of love and patience and sacrifice that you guys exhibited has just set a wonderful example for all of us in uh, that challenge of taking care of our elderly parents. And I, I really appreciate your example in that. Uh, my message today is going to be what we Christians call the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And uh, out in the foyer, um, on the left-hand side in some dark bookshelves, is this booklet called Forgiveness Forever by God. It's something that we've published here at New Life Community Church, and I just invite you to take a copy of that free of charge. Just take it on your way out the door if you'd like uh, just more about what I'm going to say today. And uh, this is a powerful passage of Scripture here where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> and... Uh, I guess I better get to the, uh, I'm sorry, mixed up here. Um, some years ago, I did some volunteering at a local hospital as a chaplain. And uh, it was a very influential experience in my life. Hospitals are amazing places. Essentially, it's where most people come into this world, and it's where most people go out of this world, is in a hospital. And uh, being in a hospital, being a chaplain in a hospital is a reminder of some of the most important realities of life, especially death. Uh, what do you think, my friend, is the biggest problem in your life? Is it that you do not have enough money? Uh, that you have problems in a relationship? Is it global warming? Is it the fact that we don't have any good candidates to vote for, pre for, the, for a president? None of those things are the biggest problem in your life, my friend. The biggest problem in your life is that we are all going to die. That's the biggest problem in our life. In Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible tells us people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That's a pretty sobering fact. You see, we are all on this train called life, and it is all going to the same destination, and you can't get off of it. We are all going to die and then face judgment. That's everyone's destiny. And uh, that will be the most important day of our life, that day that we stand before our Creator and have our life evaluated. And uh, are you ready for that day, my friend? Are you ready for that day? We don't think much about death, usually. It's not a pleasant thing to think about. Um, but funerals are that periodic reminder that every one of us is going to die someday. And the Bible reminds us that death is sometimes painful, but it is always ugly. Death is not a good thing. The Bible describes death as not only our greatest enemy, but it is even God's enemy. God describes it as one of his enemies, is death, the last enemy that he will destroy. But right now, for you and me, our greatest enemy, our greatest problem is that we're going to die. Which is why our text today from John 11 is so wonderful. Did you hear what Jesus Christ said? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Jesus said to Martha? Many people believe in an afterlife, and they even believe that somehow they will be judged and evaluated for how they lived but a lot of people believe they can solve the problem of death and defeat the enemy of death by some other way or person than Jesus Christ. But if that is so, then Jesus is a liar. Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus Christ is the only one powerful enough to enable you to beat death. If you do not entrust your life and eternity to Him, you have no hope of overcoming death and the coming judgment. Jesus said it another way elsewhere in John chapter 14. He was speaking with His disciples and said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me where I am, so that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And he was talking about this with his disciples, and one of his disciples said, well, Jesus, <laughs> we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said those famous words, Thomas, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one can go to the Father except through me. Do you hear that, my friend? No one goes to God after dying except through trusting their life and eternity to Jesus Christ. To some that sounds arrogant and narrow-minded, but let me ask you a question. Has anyone else risen from the dead? Has any other religious leader you want to follow overcome death themselves? If your greatest problem and enemy is death, wouldn't you rather get help from someone who has actually conquered death themselves? Only Jesus has done that, and this is why he alone can say, I am the resurrection and the life. And look at this amazing promise here. Jesus said, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. <laughs> People have been looking for the secret of eternal life throughout all of human history. Even to find some sort of potion to temporarily extend their life. There was a very powerful king in a Chinese dynasty in the Middle Ages who had his experts come up with an elixir to extend his life. When he drank it, he died. <laughs> Are you looking for the secret to eternal life? The answer is right here. If you believe in Christ, you will never die. This is why the Bible says elsewhere to Christians, quote, Do not grieve the death of a believer like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Yes, we grieve. We will miss people who have died. Isn't it interesting that even in our story today, Jesus Christ himself cried? Literally minutes before he was going to command Lazarus to come out of that grave and raise him from the dead, Jesus wept that his friend had died. Why? Because death is a sad thing. It's an ugly thing. But in that sadness... We have hope. We have hope. Because with Jesus Christ, we will never die. We will never perish. We have eternal life with Jesus Christ. This reminds me of something that Mike Reiner and I witnessed in a hospital one evening. We were visiting the family of one of Mike's co-workers. I think you probably, hopefully you remember this, Mike. I think his wife's mother was dying. It was his, the co-worker's wife's mother that was dying. And when we entered the room... All the family had already left except for the woman's daughter. And as I spoke with the daughter, it became evident that she did not have a relationship with Christ at all. And so I asked about her mother, and she said something like, Yeah, uh, Mom was serious about her faith and loved her Bible. And I thought, hmm, okay, probably a, probably a Christian lying there in that bed in, in a comatose state. And by the way, she had been unconscious for, if I remember correctly, several days. Hadn't spoken, and in a comatose state. I asked the mother, I'm sorry, I asked the daughter if I could pray for, the, for her mother. She said, yes, please do. And um, I laid, went over, walked over to the bed and laid my hand on her and started to pray for her. And she sat up in the bed with her eyes wide open. I was freaking out. <laughs> I finished my prayer, um, but this woman was sitting up in the bed with her eyes wide open, trying to talk. But more interestingly, she was looking intently in the upper corner of the hospital room, and she saw something. She saw someone. <laughs> and she's trying to talk, and after a very brief time, she fell back down on her pillow, and she was gone. Now, what do you think was the first thing that went through my mind when that happened? This is what went through my mind. Oh my goodness, this family's going to think I killed their mom. 
I ran out of the hospital room, down the hallway to the nurse's station, and there was already nurses passing me in the hallway. And I, and I asked a nurse, I said, well, I told a nurse what happened. And she said, yeah, don't worry about it. That happens all the time. You pastors come up here and pray for people, and they die. <laughs> so I, I felt better. What was this dear Christian woman experiencing when she was dying? I am not sure, but she had a smile on her face. And even at the point of death, she was not dying. She left her body, but she went to be with the Lord. What will your death be like? What or who is waiting for you on the other side? It depends on what you believe. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Jesus said. And I would ask you, my friend, do you believe this? I want to end by answering two questions briefly. One, how can you know? I'm sorry. How does one come to believe this, to believe in Jesus Christ like this? How does that happen? And how do you know if it has happened? Uh. I'm going to answer that question by a brief excerpt from the book of Acts. Luke talks about a woman named Lydia. And in this story, the Apostle Paul is sharing this good news about Jesus Christ with a group of women outside the city of Philippi. And Luke writes, quote, One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Then when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. There are two things described here. First, how do you come to believe in Christ? Well, Luke explains, quote, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. And that is what God has to do for you. I can be really convincing and really eloquent today about the need for you to really believe in Jesus Christ so that you can have eternal life. But the Lord has to open your heart to that message. God needs to do something miraculous and life-changing in your heart and mind to enable you to see and believe in Jesus Christ as your only Lord and your only Savior. Secondly, how do you know if that has happened? Well, you are eager to obey God and love people. Lydia and her family submitted to water baptism to demonstrate their commitment to Christ. And notice how they welcome these men into their home and love them. That's what happens when Christ really comes into your life. You love God and you love people like you never have before. Saving faith, that kind of faith, to believe in Christ like that is a gift and work from God that he does in us. But it is our good deeds when Christ comes into our life and changes our life. That's what proves that that work has actually happened. Our good deeds will never save us. Jesus did not say, if you do all these good things, then you will never die. What did he say? He said, if you believe in me, if you believe that I died on a cross to pay for you, the penalty of your sins, if you will believe that and put your trust in Him for your life and your eternity, you will never die. Funerals are a sobering reminder of the great realities surrounding death and who Jesus Christ really is, and more importantly, who He is to you. Just a few days ago, Pete was discussing with C.H. the death of another man. Pete commented that this man had a personal relationship with Christ. And C.H. turned to Pete and asked him, Do you think I believe in Christ? Wow. That right there, in that moment, a few days before C.H. died, was one of the most important moments that son had with his dad, right there. And uh, C.H. asked his son, 
do you think I believe in Christ? And Pete loved his dad enough to tell him, I think you believe in Christ like you believe in George Washington, Dad. Good man and important historical figure. But I do not believe you believe in Christ as your Savior and have given your life to Him. Hard things to say. But Pete was honest with him. What about you, friend? Does your life look like someone who believes Jesus Christ is their only Savior and Lord? Jesus said, and the only one to ever raise from the dead, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that we follow a man who rose from the dead. And uh, we recognize today that uh, death is our great enemy. And we thank you that we have someone who's gone before us and has conquered death and is willing to give us that victory if we will give our life to him and entrust him with our eternity and trust him to pay for our sins and those things that separate us from God, both now and for all eternity. Jesus, would you do what only you can do today? And open hearts here today to hear this message. We commit this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The family has requested that we sing Amazing Grace for our final song.
Well, I know I speak for the whole family when I say that we really appreciate your presence here today. And um, thank you for being here and listening to these stories. And uh, you, Gross family, are in our prayers. And uh, let's, uh, let's do pray. Father, we just thank you again that we can trust you with the biggest realities of being human. We can trust you with both our life and, and even something as huge as death. Only you are big enough. Only you are powerful enough to trust with something like that. And we just thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have that even though we, we grieve for the loss of loved ones, that we grieve with a hope that we will see them again someday if they trust Christ like we have. And we're so grateful for that, that Jesus, you have come to give your life so that we could live forever. Again, we just ask you to give the family grace, encourage them, give them that hope that um, in their own uh, resurrection and uh, that they had put their hope in you Lord Jesus, as well. We ask you to be with them this week. We thank you for all the people that have worked so hard for even this service and even the luncheon here that's going to follow. We ask for your blessing on that. We commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have some instruction? Okay. Yeah, so um, if you head out this door right here towards the foyer, and just a reminder that there's a lot of things out there that uh, if you hadn't have an opportunity to read earlier, you might like to read, including about Larry's scandalous birth, check it out. If you go out these side doors here and head that way, there is some food that's available, and I'm sure the family would appreciate you staying and fellowshipping with them. Again, thank you for being here.